Okay. So we'll have some people joining in, I'm sure, in a moment, but I think this is a good time for us to start. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure some people will be joining in soon, but uh, my name is Joaquin Lapuz. I am the Web Content Coordinator of the Humanities Across Borders program here at IES, and I'd like to formally welcome everyone to this our second session of the HAB online conversation series on academic ontologies. Why do we need stories of place-based belonging? So I'm going to go over a few reminders first before we fully get into the conversation. Um, this, this session will be recorded, but only the speakers' presentations uh, will be seen and their faces. The participants will not be seen at all. And the Q&A portion will not be well, will not be um, recorded whatsoever. Uh, important thing as well, um, if you have any questions for our speakers, please put them in the meeting chat below. We have some time set aside for our speakers to answer all of your questions, so uh, feel free to type them out and then we will get to them when we get to that portion of the talk. So to properly discuss the academic ontology series as a whole and to introduce this particular session, I'd like to welcome the academic director of the Humanities Across Borders program, Dr. Arti Kalra. So Arti, please take it away. Thank you, Joaquin. Welcome everyone to this online conversation session, a forum reflecting upon academic ontologies or ways of thinking and doing initiated for students and early career scholars by the Humanities Across Borders Program and the Fellowship Program of the IAS. Our aim is to put into question the dominant form of knowledge transmission that informs and shapes textual production, performance, transmission, and reception within academic publics. Whereas the first session focused on storytelling as a research strategy, today we shall discuss why do we need stories of place-based belonging. I wanted to give you some information about the inspiration behind this session, uh, which is the book, Belonging, A Culture of Place, which has been authored by Gloria Watkins, who's better known by her pen name, Bell Hooks, uh, who was an African-American feminist writer and educationist who died only a few years ago in December 2021. We are inspired by her use of childhood memories of landscapes, objects, smells, and stories as a reconstructive device for healing the self and the world. I would like to make a small quote from Bell Hook's book, um, and I quote, the world of my childhood was a world of contrasts. On one hand, a lush green landscape of fast horses, natural waterfalls, tobacco crops, and red birds. And on the other hand, a world of greedy exploitation of big homes and little shacks, a world of fear and domination of man over nature, of white over black, of top and bottom. In my childhood, I dreamed about a culture of belonging. Bell Hooks points out that to fully belong anywhere, one must understand the ground of one's being, which for her was the agrarian life in the Southern state of Kentucky, amidst tobacco fields, blue lake, and Appalachian Hills in the United States of America. With this session, I, we bring together three scholar activists who are working with questions of place and belonging from three different locations, Myanmar and Thailand, Chiang Mai and Thailand, Pakistan and Hong Kong. Each speaker shares with us her own methodological tools for place-based storytelling in evoking what Bell Hooks refers to as the power of a counter hegemonic culture of belonging. Each presentation that ensues articulates a landscape of memory, thoughts, actions, and imagination associated with a place. 
And now uh, I would like you uh, to be uh, introduced to the each of the speakers by our fellowship coordinator, Laura Erber. Laura. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, second academic ontologies conversation session. Uh, my name is Laura Erber. I am the fellowship program coordinator at uh, IAS. Uh, I'm delighted to moderate this uh, conversation alongside my colleague, Arthi Kaura. So today we have the privilege of hosting three remarkable speakers uh, whose research and practices are intricately connected to the themes of place, belonging, and storytelling, whether through the lenses of memory and emotional attachment or the lenses of citizenship policies, their work touches on the various aspects of our sense of place and ways of telling it. Uh, I will provide you with a brief introduction to each of the speakers. Um, so with our, uh, let's say, guest speaker, because um, uh, the other two speakers are currently fellows at IAS. So I will start with Asai. So she's a teacher educator uh, working in uh, Thailand and Myanmar, but also in Burma. Uh, she's an education policy advocate working various initiatives for ethnic marginalized education, migrant indigenous education, also education in emergencies and conflicts and with refugee education in Burma, Myanmar, and Thailand for almost two decades. She's the director of Thinking Classroom Foundation and the network coordinator of the Peace and Justice Network. She serves as a secretary of reading and writing for Critical Thinking International Consortium and a coalition member of Global Gender Transformative Education Coalition led by a United Nations Girls Education Initiative. Our um, other speaker, Zara Hussein. Uh, she's an architect and cultural geographer who works with the mountain communities in Northern Pakistan. She leads the Large Word Visiting School Program, an interdisciplinary and cross-curricular program using creative methods of engagement and knowledge production with local communities. Uh, as a fellow at IAS, uh, Zara is working on her book, Heritage Cosmopolitics, Belonging in Fragile Futures, which investigates the Hindi Kush Himalaya mountain region. And uh, Isha Ting, uh, she's also a research fellow at IAS, and she worked as assistant professor at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Uh, Ting received her PhD from the University of Chicago, and she's currently working on her manuscript on the social movements and artistic act activism in post-handover uh, Hong Kong. Uh, her project examines the urban condition that nurtures identity and citizenship and explore the changing contour of the Hong Kong people's political subjectivities. Ting also writes more generally on contemporary uh, sinophone literature and cinema, especially migrant workers, literature and culture in contemporary China. Uh, to open this conversation, I would like to read a very short poem by a Mexican poet called José Emilio Pacheco that speaks about a condition of drastic unbelonging, which has become more and more common in various parts of the world. So I'll just read the, the, this short poem and then we will open for the three speakers to, um, yeah, to, um, yeah, come in. Uh, Unwanted. The guard won't let me in. I'm over the age limit. I come from a country that no longer exists. My papers aren't in order. I'm missing a stamp. I need another signature. I don't speak the language. I don't have a bank account. I failed the entrance exam. My job at the factory has been canceled. I've been fired today and forever. I have no influence. I've been here in this world for a long time, and our bosses say it's time to shut up and sink into the rubbish dump. So, please, I think we will start with Asai's uh, yeah, presentation, and then uh, Isha Ting, and then Zara Hussein. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Laura, for very generous uh, introduction 
and also uh, RT and all the team that inviting me and thank you for having me. So I am a uh, teacher educator, as, as Laura said, um, policy advocate uh, for the right to education, especially for marginalized um, minority groups in, in, in Myanmar across the country. So my presentation is about from my teaching experience since I am a uh, teacher educator and how we use the story to um, to have uh, to to ensure right to education and also uh, indigenous education perspective. So I would like to start by giving a brief background of uh, Myanmar. Some people. Uh, it's you, formerly known as Burma. Uh, some of you may know that uh, our country has, uh, in 2021, in February, we have coup data. Uh, because of coup data, now intense fighting is going on. And then every day people are running for life. And then education is in chaos and in crisis. So uh, it's really difficult uh, to... Um, organize even informal learning in the conflict area. But the story is powerful too, to, um, to learn something, to learn from the, and then it's also have a powerful to in psychologically, uh, emotional well-being for the students and teachers. So how it, this, uh, my, all my slides are based on my experience of providing uh, storytelling uh, methods in education. Uh, so, my my. Um, so how we mobilize in in curriculum development? How we mobilize resources in local like arts, form, music, and stories that integrated in the in the teaching and learning curriculum. Since we are in responding in education emergency in conflict, so. Uh, these are the, that uh, we cannot use regular curriculum or content that has uh, usually used. We so now it's in in con uh, in conflict areas. We are we need to adapt and respond to the um, emergency situation. So how we uh, really create learning opportunity for children and how we train the teachers to use local story local knowledge and local resources, how to mobilize. So these are uh, only reflect on our experience. So as um, Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, we have 54, over 54 million people. And then we have what, more than 135 ethnic groups. We have been experiencing more than seven decades of um, civil war, but, um, Unfortunately, uh, long going for long civil war, plus we have coup d'etat. And then now uh, some of you may heard about the news, uh, but, but the, the international news agency are not allowed to enter. That's why the news about the Myanmar is, 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 is usually you, you will not hear, you will not uh, see in the international news. So in our Myanmar situation, we have, because of the long, prolonged uh, conflict, we have um, different education uh, providers in, in conflict areas. So our, uh, where I work as a teacher educator and policy advocacy at the Thinking Classroom Foundation is we provide teacher training and policy advocacy for um, non-state education sector, which are, who are from outside the, the, the state and the government cannot reach in the conflict areas. And why we use a place-based uh, story is like we want to protect and promote our own language, our knowledge, ancestral knowledge, and uh, our cultural identity and protection of our land. Um, it, another rationale why we want to use the story is uh, it also uh, if the students are familiar with the start with use with their context, their experience, learning become their life and their uh, learning become, becomes 
uh, familiar, the context-based, contextualized curriculum, and that it makes them enjoy in this classroom. And then we also promote mother tongue-based multilingual education system. So um, the children's uh, language, minority languages are allowed in the school, community-based school. So uh, this also helped to decrease the dropout rate. And then their experiences and their childhood memory, their, uh, their stories that were told by their uh, parents or their grandparents are, are integrated in teaching and learning uh, practices. So, and also the community, parents and community also can take ownership and contribute in the development process. Um, and these are the, uh, the stories are powerful and then these stories are created by the community and we just facilitate uh, children and the community to get this story to be, you need to be used in the teaching and learning and integrated in subject, other subjects area. And a teacher and parents and community, they mobilize uh, stories or art forms and nature resources like plants using uh, their own plants from the forest or the uh, domestic uh, that daily they, they can see in the, their own garden, uh, animals and forest, rivers, mountain that surrounding are used in the, in the teaching and learning. So without relying on the state curriculum, like in our country, um, I would like to say it's different from other countries. We have uh, our central government will produce and distribute one single textbook and one monolingual system and one single textbook to all the um, area, uh, either uh, urban or remote area. These were used by the students, but these content knowledge are not based on the students, uh, their background, and their, it doesn't reflect on their culture or values or nothing. It's from the central government, which is very hegemonic uh, curriculum uh, and education system and one language that uh, the students from minority group, uh, indigenous group, do not understand. So we as um, like advocate and also teacher educator, we collaborate with community and parents to have mother tongue based multilingual education to promote indigenous education using the more local resources. More. So these are the uh, I will also show, and then there are some, uh, you know, that theories uh, for why we use local resources. It's like uh, our, we are using the Bandura social connected learning theory from the education theories that these children uh, by socializing processes, they learn from, uh, from the intergenerational learning uh, environment, they will imitate, right? They will imitate by different forms, and then this will also adapt in their um, uh, connected level and their behavior. And so this this kind of social learning theory we use. And another the, uh, one is that we use the framework of uh, participation in 3Ds, like developing process, and then uh, we discovering process first, and then after that, we, which, uh, which uh, theme or which resources will be based and then develop based on that experience uh, and then based on that decision from the students, from the parents, to, from the community, uh, we decide to develop the, the content or the books uh, story. So this is also another theories that we use from uh, Vygotsky, social learning theories, uh, Scott Boarding, uh, we learn from each other and then it also reflect on inter intergenerational learning. Uh, we also use the concept of decolonizing uh, because the, in our decolonizing, decolonization of our content and our culture, our, our knowledge that we have to start with our own local based knowledge. Uh, that's the, uh, so this is one of the example of the community engagement and intergenerational intergenerational learning, uh, sorry, uh, intergenerational learning is 
that we are uh, we invite elders people who knows about the very traditional instruments to learn to share their their instruments and then after that, these instruments can be learned in different subject area, integrated to the subject area. So it really, the, after this kind of implementation, students enjoy in the classroom, and then they also learn about their ancestor knowledge and music and different arts forms. So in the process of developing, uh, is we based on the local culture calendar. So which month is farming started, which month is there, uh, what kind of activity um, they do in the specific months based on the school calendar. So that in that sense, we use story, we use art forms, we use uh, uh, agriculture uh, activities to, to develop whole subjects, you know, uh, integrated subjects. So I will show some of the examples. So these are the story developed in one big picture and it reflects the livelihood culture and then this by created by the community and use uh, also the teachers, the students from local community. So these are the this reflect they are the whole livelihood, how they grow up, how what are the social activities that they usually do. And then these are used from uh this picture are narrated by the students. It differently can be narrated and also based on their uh, their experience they can talk and that is free to uh, create this uh, create a story a new story based on the picture so this also reflect on daily uh, activities that uh, in the in the rural area and that also reflect of a uh, big picture method that telling a story. This is uh, students can be, um, they, they, it shows one of the villages uh, work in, in Thailand in remote area. And then the students will use, or teacher will use this big picture to uh, narrate the story. So these are the, some of the, uh, one of the ethnic groups story. And this also the livelihood. Uh, so it's a benefit of this. How do we? Yeah. So the benefit of stories in conflict is is really effect for the social emotional well being. It's really good for them, and then it also record their memory and they reflect the, uh, and also their ownership in learning. It also uh, that increase their critical thinking. Uh, questioning skills and language skill, language competency, and also it also appreciate of uh, other culture. You know, we have a systematic development of uh, context space and then expanding of other culture, and it also appreciation of social co cohesion, building of social cohesion and peace. Also, it's also um, built on the curriculum and also. Uh, sustainable culture and identity. It will help for uh, individual community that, that reach sustainable development. Uh, so I think this one already talked and the, here, uh, the appreciation of own culture and respect for other culture. And also I would like to uh, show that this is in Burmese, how we integrate. So this is a, a pattern of the, it has a story uh, each pattern in in traditional clothing or traditional costume, we have social meanings uh, that um, and and it's behind social meanings. It's also the background how its social meaning becomes. It each pattern has a story, background story. So based on that story, we create like learning how to learn subject in in science and language like noun or adjective or sentences, what are, and then mathematics, how do we integrate? And we, uh, social studies, um, these, uh, these all subjects in, in based on their great, each great level. So that, that's um, how we use the local resources and including art form and social 
uh, art forms and music and all the, this indigenous knowledge and stories are created based on the local knowledge and promoting and pro protecting indigenous rights and protection of land, culture and language and identity. So I, uh, uh, that's all my, my presentation is. So if you have any, you might have a questions. Uh, we are, I am happy to uh, accommodate the question and for the discussions. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, I'm bringing a case from Hong Kong, but first, uh, maybe an important differentiation to make is that both Azai and Sarah here are, are practitioners. They 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 speak about their own activism and uh, the practice they do. But here, I'm actually bringing a case from Hong Kong, a group called Actu uh, the Artist. And I'm here, my role is more of the scholar that I speak about their practice and how they achieve the goals they lay out for themselves and how it works in the context of Hong Kong. So, um, so this group called V Activists, they were found in 2007 and they have been active since. Uh, in the last year, after the introduction of the national, national security law in Hong Kong, which made their practice quite dangerous, uh, they have been laying low since and trying to look for other ways to to continue their engagement. But <clears throat> so here would be more a review of what they the, the practice they have been conducting since uh, 2007 up to about 2020. And so if you look at their name, uh, the activist. So the activist work combines art and activism, right? And the V is left uh for for ambiguity you it can be video it can be uh, some sort of uh it can refer to vagina as a feminist discourse so um but here the group particularly they combine art and activism in the way that they think art uh, artistic expression would actually give the people a voice and enhance a political participation <clears throat> because art is Inherent, in, inherently a form of expression. And it would also allow the participants to see each other and to see, you know, to see themselves, to articulate themselves, but also to see the other and in this way connect with the other. And this is particularly important because the grassroots groups are often pit against each other in their conflict, in the competition for social welfare, etc., for jobs, for security. And so by bringing different groups together to conduct a certain uh, action that would allow them to see each other's situation and find commonality and hopefully build solidarity. And so, so this is also, uh, this is also a way to organize the community and build solidarity among these groups. So actually on this, on their practice, I have already published a book chapter, uh, which addresses their connection with global activism, especially with the practice of community media in South America. And But then in my own book, I'm addressing their practice in the context of uh, urban renewal movements. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in my paper, you can Google Academia EBU and my name, Chuchun Deng, then you will be able to download there. So today, uh, I cannot go to my next slide. Okay. <clears throat> so in terms of the context of their intervention, they work in neighborhoods that are working class uh, majority. And they also, they work particularly on projects. You know, the, when the, a specific building or a neighborhood faces urban renewal and the Westerns would be kicked out, then they come in and try to help organize the, the affected uh, residents. So the, they try to help them to articulate their goals, which one is the housing rights of the urban poor. Because a lot of these, are, they are not owners of the apartment. They are, if, if they're owners, they, they will be compensated more justly. But if they're tenants, if, they're, if they live in an illegal rooftop studio, then those are very problematic cases. They will just be kicked out with no compensation at all. And so how to articulate their right 
to housing and their right to return to the neighborhood becomes something that is quite tricky. And without their help, most of these residents would just be kicked out. So they often start with a screening. And so here is how screening uh, is used or helps in community organizing because they have been into many of these kind of neighborhoods and in each neighborhood, they would, they basically have a camera with them. So everywhere they go, they will be filming and then they will edit they added the, the footage into some sort of a film or just a long piece of video. And this would allow them to bring the experience of, of uh, urban renewal res resistance against urban renewal to the next neighborhood facing similar situation. They also often bring along uh, the participants in the previous movement to the screening so that they can meet the new members of EWTs and pass on their experience and knowledge on how to deal with government. And then um, one of the main questions for them is how to co-create social change with the grassroots members. Because when the group comes in, you know, they have different kind of education. The, the group members have different education, they have experience with art creation and community organizing. So to avoid the activists from taking over the movement, they really emphasize on this non-hierarchical relationship and skill sharing approach with the community members. And they actually don't see, even at the end of the movement, they may produce a film, but they don't see themselves as authors of the film. And in the editing process, they really prioritize the wishes and the voice of the community members. If, a, if someone doesn't like how she, appear, she or he appears on the screen, they would they would cut it out. They would not say, this is my film, I'm the author, and this is how art works. In, they would not deny the voice of the, of the community member. So this is strictly a process of collective decision making. And so how do they, how do they integrate uh, filmmaking in a participatory mode into this process of social movement organizing? So often they would use documentary production as part of the organizational work. For example, someone who is quiet, who does not speak out in meetings, they will probably do an interview with them, edit the footage, and bring this interview into the next meeting to for the for the majority of the members to see, oh, actually there is a dissenting voice. This person is not able to speak up because of certain reasons, but here now this marginal voice is brought back into the group. Or when a movement uh comes to a uh, you know comes to a point of depression they, they they don't see any progress everyone is sad and depressed they can edit out what they have done previously and collectively show to the group then you know seeing one's face on the screen and seeing the collective actions that they have uh, conducted before gives the gives the members a, a sense of encouragement you know they have gone through all this and it also it, it can also create a moment of reflection, like, have we done something wrong? Have our strategy been wrong? Should we have done, should we have do this in a different way? So the, the both production, both filmmaking and screening becomes part of the organizational process. And earlier I talked about how they denounce ownership and give this collective decision-making to the members. And they also often give a cam left a cam camera to the community members who are willing to take it so that when they are not around, they can, they can still film what is happening in the neighborhood. Or in a collective action, when they are demonstrating, they would just tap on the shoulder of a community member and say, oh, this camera is really heavy. Why don't you take it from me? And as a way to, to uh, pass out the burden of filming and an invitation for someone else to film. So, what is very important in the practice is that the end product of the film is not as important as what the filmmaking and the screening has achieved in the process. Does it help the, the movement? Does it uh, bring some changes to the community members who are involved? And so in the process, they will often highlight some creative activities that the community members would be able to achieve and, and do together. For example, this kind of puppet show or the songs that they have written on their own. Or they will conduct some media literacy workshops, introduce some means, for example, photo story. And in this case, they introduce, they ask each member to pick up a toy that will represent themselves 
or we present one specific uh, moment of discrimination or uh, humiliation that they encountered, and then to produce a video, like a picture, a photo video. They also use this kind of very low tech way to produce animation because some of the members are good with fabrics and meeting. And, um, and then in terms of screen, so when the film is made, screening is a very important part for the, for the activism. Previously, I have speak about how they bring the, you know, how they, how they come into a new site by bringing the film. By, by starting by screening. And when the, often when a movement ends, either mostly in failure, like the government, because real estate is so expensive, the government rarely concede to their demands. But then they will bring the film back to the, to the location, to the, to the site, even when it's in the process of being demolished and they would do a screening on the side of the street. And the audience would need to come to the site. They would need to encounter this ruin, they would need to be sitting right next to someone, a victim of the of this eviction, and watch the film. And so often the, the post-screening QA would engage with what's happening and their hardship. And then it would the the discussion would create some sort of mobilization of a different sort. You know, it would invite the audience to participate, to join them, and to bring the it would bring these participants to the next site of eviction. And they also do this regular TV, uh, regular street TV, like once a month on this on 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 a small space in this poor neighborhood, in which they will address different issues faced by the community members or next round of urban eviction. And in the long run, what they have achieved is that they maintain a public record of this bottom up resistance, so that the new members who face eviction do not have to reinvent the wheel. They will be able to, um, to know about the previous experience and knowledges that have accumulated. And through this, you know, the, the community members who have previously participated in this resistance would be able to continue to engage even after their movement has ended. Some of them could follow, continue to connect with the group and come to different neighborhoods and help the newcomers of uh, social movements. And so, uh, so, in, so the, the group is able to continuously engage with different sites, but in the process, there's also an accumulation of public record and of this urban network of resistance. So uh, yeah, if in, the, in the discussion session, I will share some of the stories they tell. Yeah, thank you. Take away, Sarah. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'll just dive into the presentation so that we're on time. I'll be talking about narrating otherwise, uh, a practice that we've been trying to sort of uh, explore through the larger visiting school, which is a program that I run in uh, different sites in Pakistan. And the basic idea is to get the community, uh, lo the local community academicians and practitioners together to rethink space. And uh, I've been trained as an architect and then I did my PhD in human geography. So I've really been using spatial investigation as a mode for understanding how place is organized, managed, uh, appropriated and contested by different actors and processes. So telling stories of places complex, um, relational and requires paying attention to uh, connections and modes of, um, sorry, what do you see? Um, yeah, wait. Can you see the slides? Wait. Wait. I share it again, wait. Do you see it now? Okay. All right. So basically, the visiting school brings together 
So the map is there. You can see it brings together local communities, ac academicians, practitioners. And the idea is to basically try and understand how space is organized by different actors and the, and the processes that are taking place. Um, we conducted a visiting school uh, on Gwadar, and that is something that I will be talking about and how we try to sort of understand uh, the way the place is being made and maintained by local communities, but also how the government is sort of intervening in uh, what's happening in Gwadar. Um, one way of engaging with representations of space, place geographies is through the production of maps, um, especially those created by the colonial powers to define, claim ownership and manage territories. So in the process of uh, so in the process, place is transformed as a territory to be managed and governed by the powerful other from the outside. But maps have also sort of been seen as um, nation building artifacts by uh, Anderson when he talks about the imagined communities. And uh, this is basically how institutions that enable in nationalist uh, enthusiasm for a colonial state. The basically the image of a physical space when it is seen from above gives a sense of wholeness of truth and thus claims objectivity in terms of representation. So what this view does is that it flattens the surface and is completely removed from the realities on the ground. It's a powerful tool for narrativizing a place and its people. And this is something that we increasingly see in processes of globalization as well. Uh, they also tend to produce their own imaginaries of space and regimes of representation, you know, like a top down bird's eye view, which is not really a natural way of, of looking at or understanding space. And such is the case with the uh, Gwadar as well, uh, which is a coastal town in south of Pakistan. It's considered remote until recently due to the absence of road linkages. But within the grand vision of the Silk Road economic belt, Gwadar's deep seaport is known as the jewel in the crown due to its strategic location, potentially connecting Central and South Asia to the Middle East and Africa. The sheer scale and temporality of such an infrastructural development tempts the imagination unleashing capitalist desires, mining economic benefits, and projecting mostly economic possibilities and potentials that such connectivity offers. For those not living in Gwadar, this imaginary is produced through maps and images projected by the state and uh, real estate agencies operating in Gwadar. When I visited uh, Gwadar in 2019 as part of the Lodgeford Visiting School, we were basically looking at the infrastructural imaginaries. We were exploring how um, the area is uh, basically inhabited by the local people. And we were quite surprised by what we encountered. The hammerhead, which is uh, known as uh, the way Gwadar is seen, this hammerhead that you can see, was not really visible. And um, at all actually, because the surface isn't flat. So it is not possible to get that wide angle view of the sea, which the real estate agencies sell on their advertisements. Not to mention lands um, which have been made inaccessible for the local communities, especially the fisher folk. So the thriving fishing communities, which have since decades, uh, strong connections across the Arabian Sea and Indian Ocean are now displaced from their deep fertile sea. The people call themselves children of the sea as their everyday life and belonging is informed and inspired by the sea. Fisher folk known as Mahigir have their own particular ways of knowing and navigating the sea, not through maps, but their knowledge of tides, um, winds and experience of place. It was evident that the story being told by the state authorities and agencies was that of progress and global linkages in Gwadar, rendering the lives of local communities and their place completely absent. And we could also sense, uh, a sen we could also see a sense of loss of the local landscape for the local communities themselves. It matters what stories we tell other stories with, as Haraway asks, in order to resist and even rebel against hegemonic forms of thinking and living. So there is no single story. Interruptions happen, tangents are followed, threads are woven, tangled and untangled. So by talking to the locals, we were trying to understand and see how they are actually engaging with the with the with the landscape. So the Gwadar's fertile sea figures as economically important and strate strategically located, but also as a material and symbolic wealth. The history of the fertile sea is also a history of colonization, movements and flows of ships and pirates and saints, and more recently globalization, alongside the Mahigir that live and thrive in them. 
So we were basically trying to explore a mapping strategy that attempts to grasp the diminishing place, featuring the tangible, immaterial, invisible human spirits and more than human entities and their worlds. And we were basically talking to people who were there, talking to the Mahi Gir, trying to make some drawings with them, listening to their stories and trying to really see how place is imagined and uh, narrated within their stories. So this is something which I call... Um, cosmopolitical maps, uh, which are an attempt to recognize human and non-human entities. I've written about this in a paper and I can send a link in the chat if anybody is interested in reading more about it. But it is basically a mapping process through which these potentially conflicting orderings are rendered visible in a way that also uh, that questions the status quo. So what we try to do with cosmopolitical maps is, uh, which I'm going to talk about here, is three things. So visibility, frame and point of view. So together with the community, their stories and landscapes, we attempted to draw in entities that are at risk of erasure in order to make those worlds reachable and visible. So what is able to feature on the map, making these, uh, making visible those entities that are absent. So these are entities that the local communities really kind of relate with. They feature in their everyday lives. These are stories that they've been listening to from their elders. Um, and then another thing that we've been trying out in our iterations, so these are not like the only maps, we've made like many iterations of these maps with local uh, locals involved in the process. Um, the other thing is the frame. So what gets included in your frame, what is seen in the frame? Um, so in the uh, maps or the images that you see of Gwadar that the state puts up is something that really kind of uh, pulls the land uh, back into uh, back into uh, the state of Pakistan. But the way the locals describe land is, you know, they're really kind of pushing themselves out to the sea. And they're really making those connections across the Arabian Sea and Indian Ocean. And for them, sea is what uh, stands at the forefront. And so, uh, so there's like a push and pull factor which is happening in the way that the framing is done. For them, the frame, uh, the the ocean really uh, takes up the entire frame, and they kind of um, are in it. Um, but for, of course, for the for the state, the the hammerhead and the land is very important to kind of claim that that hammerhead. And then the third one is um, point of view. And uh, so the children of the sea also narrated that their elders believe that this is Samandar ki naf, which is also belly, uh, belly button or the umbilical cord of the sea. And this is where the sea gets its nourishment. And um, um, their world is in the center, which is surrounded by water and the usual land sea border diminishes and the entanglements of fish life, stars and other uh, than human beings become visible. Um, and, and, you know, in, the, in, in what we heard from the locals, they say that, you know, camels are known to remember and hold a grudge if they are ro wronged. And that centers um, on this map as a symbol of resistance for the local communities, uh, which are, uh, you know, being kind of driven out of their uh, lands, they're being, uh, their access to the fertile sea has been uh, uh, closed off by the state, uh, they're increasingly um, uh, made to sort of stay away from the the areas where they had been fishing, and uh, they've been displaced from their uh, olden sort of towns and um, spaces as well. So the idea is basically to try through these maps try and understand what the place means to them and how they kind of come to belong in these spaces. So the cosmopolitical maps basically provide um, a space for telling multiple stories that often resist the dominant narratives. So by employing discursive and material techniques, this mapping process attempts to envision and compose common worlds by recognizing entities and actors that are otherwise ignored, silenced, misrepresented. Um, and then these uh, landscapes are overwhelmingly um, ordered and shaped by capitalist extractive modes of uh, value creation. So in doing this, they make visible alternative worlds, which at times requires befriending jinns and saints or madmen and poets who roam, roam the streets or navigate traces and remnants in the landscape through stories, folklore or objects and practices that shape uh, shape their belonging. So these maps raise important questions with reference to which lies, landscapes, entities, and ways of being in and navigating the world are considered legitimate, sustainable, and worthy of building a future with. 
So these maps are not just tools of representation, but they, you know, they're also something that helps us understand what place becomes in the process of relating with and belonging to. So we as producers also play a role in the shaping this narrative, but we can discuss that in the conversation afterwards. And what we sort of do with these maps then is that um, the, the local communities are sort of um, fear this sense of loss of a landscape, which is very rich for them. And it is being erased by these new maps and uh, visualizations that are coming up. Um, so one of the things that we sort of did with these maps was we took them back to the community um, uh, school children and um, we sort of made exercises around these so that the local uh, school children could engage with these maps and sort of try and uh, engage with the entities and um, and the ways the, these stories are being uh, told. Um, so I think I'll stop here. Are we done? No, it's uh, Okay, I, but but I think I'm done. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zara. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zara, Isha, and Asai uh, for these really fascinating uh, presentations, also covering many different aspects, regions, and ways of engaging with communities, the main political uh, landscapes, and also uh, very, very, um, I think, complex and, and, and inspiring also uh, practices you have been developing in this different context. We have a set of four questions that will help guide the conversation from now on before we open up to questions from the, the audience. Uh, I will pose these questions, uh, um, me and Artie, we will be uh, posing these questions to the three speakers and they will answer to each of them as they wish. Uh, so the first question would be, uh, so how stories, I think you have been covering this in maybe different ways, but maybe it's, it's a moment to focus more on this. So how stories speak to belonging, nature and scale of belonging. I think of course, Zara has been also uh, yeah, dealing with the uh, scale and perspective and standpoints of yeah uh, how to represent but maybe it would be also interesting to listen uh issues and asides also uh yeah perspectives on this thank you yeah one of the example from my my teacher training or my uh, experience of teaching with the children is that uh when we when we bring out the, our one of the symbolic of our ethnic group, uh, there are uh, you know we there are some conflict you know some conflict of some people are minority or minority they feel like marginalized uh, by the majority in the ethnic group, but learning from this story about the unity story um, in the ancestor. In, in our ancestor, they will, they will, you know, in the story, um, it was the oral uh, story that mentioned about the all the ethnic minority groups. They, they, they stay together, and because uh, when there's hunger, uh, uh, they, they have there's something happened. They help each other, and this also symbolizes in the our cultural pool that we have a unity dance every year. We get together every year in January. Um, so this also, ref, you know, it also changed the perspective of children and also teacher themselves by doing this, um, you know, co-creating of this story together with community and teachers and parents. And this sense of belonging, they think that we are minority of minority, you know, uh, sometimes uh, the marginalized uh, we are marginalized by the majority group, but in the history, in the oral history, or in the story of this particular, um, particular our unity dance, and the the this history show that we are united. We were united before, and we are. There was no one is above someone else. There is no minority of minority, but it, this historical or oral stories narrate uh, learning from and then they just realize from that story and then it's also create a sense of belonging appreciation of themselves and their their value and they didn't learn about through this methodology 
uh, they learn about their appreciation of their culture and sense of they have, they value their culture and they value about uh, you know they develop sense of belonging. That's one of the the experience that I uh, we we did in the teacher training. Thank you. So I think the kind of belonging that Asa's story articulate to a more based on the community, on the culture. And, you know, it can be from a small community to the bigger region or to the nation. And I think Sarah here based more on its landscape and the kind of belonging, stories of belonging that addressed in my case is really a class-based identity. Um, actually here, can I uh, just quickly share two more slides with you? So these stories that I will share in the following comes from this documentary film called Walk on Suning Road produced by the artist. And in it, for example, one of the stories is, uh, is told by this woman. She is a new migrant in Hong Kong. She doesn't speak the local dialect that is Cantonese. She doesn't speak it very well. So she's very, a very hesitant participant. She doesn't really speak up in the group. And so the filmmaker just follows her for a day. And at the first, what, during the initial interview, she would say, oh, at what time do you wake up? She would say, oh, I woke up at 10 o'clock, you know. But then the day when she is followed, she actually woke up at 4 o'clock because she needs to cook breakfast for her child so that her child can go to school with a full tummy. And after that, she goes back to sleep for a little bit. And then she woke, wake up and she get ready and, and prepare breakfast for her husband. And then she go to work as a cleaner in a local restaurant. Also throughout the day, we kind of see that she is always calculating and counting. She's always, uh, you know, calculating how much time she has so that she can bring her, bring lunch to her husband who is working nearby. And then she has to calculate how much money she can spend during this day to buy food for the night and for tomorrow because she doesn't have a refrigerator. And so she has to, you know, fo following her trajectory throughout the day, we also see that her life is really de dependent on the on this the spacing of this neighborhood because this is where she find cheap housing, she find public school, that and um, and then she find this minimum wage job. There is a night market that has second hand products, so she can she really depends on this network of what of daily necessities that are all nearby. She doesn't need to spend extra on public transportation, and so. Even though it's a, it's a narrative, right? It's following her for a day. What we see is a mapping that comes out. Here is her, a map of life chances and also a routine of instant nonstop labor. And after when this editing of this footage is shown within the group, then we see her own reflection. You know, she said, actually, I see myself as a, I, I see myself as a legitimate worker. And a right bearing citizen because I actually work non stop throughout the day. And so, this mapping here functions as a moment of empowerment that she sees clearly her own class position. And then, she here she's saying that, how, how do I say that? How do I say that? We can actually, you know, if we move out, then we cannot get the justice that we deserve. So, the justice, this word is a new word for her that she learned in the process. And then another story is told by this man called uh, Mr. Ho. So he he has a small store in this night market where she he buys the secondhand cell phone. We sells them to to Africans who come to buy secondhand cell phones to resell in in Africa. And he was taking again taking the filmmaker slash activist around the neighborhood. And then he introduced this 15 minute of living circle. It's itself also an economic system. It's not like here we are talking about friends and our emotions. It is an economic system, an economic circle. And he's articulating it vis-a-vis -vis what the government was promoting at that time, the one hour living and consumption circle that includes Hong Kong and the nearby city Shenzhen and how the two are connected by this super high speed rail. And then when with his narration, we can also see that you know he has a, this small small space which is just a table, but then he takes care of that space. When he smokes, he collects his own cigarette butt and put it away in the garbage bin. He does not 
uh, you know, he, he he puts his small table outside a restaurant nearby. People know that this is his space. If he didn't come for a few days, people would ask about him. So, and then he talks about how in a in a real space like that, not an online space, a physical space entails face-to-face interaction. And this would promote a habit of negotiation and cooperation. Because for every conflict, you cannot call the police, you know. You have to resolve it with your neighbor yourself. And this would entail that this habit of self-management and the practice for democracy. You govern yourself. You don't always wait for a higher power to come and solve your problems for you. And then it also creates a network of codependency in which, you know, the pay service, such as taking, watching your child for two hours, uh, can, like accompanying the elderly to the hospital visit, it can all be done through a culture of reciprocity rather than uh, through this pay service. And then the community is also a network that protects and benefits not only your friends, community members who are poor, but also strangers and even people who are your enemy. Because the real estate agent, which is trying to kick them out, is actually someone who was also helped in a life-threatening situation by Mr. Ho Behop before. So this network actually, because of its physical proximity to all these people, it actually protects everyone and not just friends. So here, this these stories that I uh, that I share that is shared through this documentary film. It actually speaks to that sense of belonging, which is place based, but it doesn't need to, um, you know, identity politics in terms of culture and and you know local localism or nationalism. It was really based on this uh, working class ethics. Yeah. Thanks, Isha. Um, I think how belonging sort of works in the maps that we've been uh, producing with the community is how they're able to see their own uh, place visualized uh, in ways that they can sort of relate to it. Um, And these um, visualizations have actually kind of helped them speak about um, and order their their thoughts and the and their kind of uh, attachments to certain beings and places um, in ways that sort of um, concretizes their idea about place because they are also sort of the local communities in Gwadar are also sort of used to the maps or the images about Gwadar that they're seeing uh, on their phones which are again projected by the state so the maps then became um, a a surface for them to kind of look back at themselves um, and their memories and uh, and the stories. So I think in in that process, uh, the belonging sort of uh, to place sort of sort of happened. Yeah. So um, thank you um, uh, for the all three speakers for. Uh, this conversation. I I would like to now go to the second question, just to remind you that we have five or six minutes per question. Um, uh, This one, uh, the question is, uh, how can stories speak to context outside of the local context in which, uh, uh, you know, you have spoken about? So the idea is, how can they be disseminatable or how can we use this methodology outside of say Myanmar, Pakistan and Hong Kong? Uh, Because you speak of very powerful methods uh, which make a difference. You Each one of you have spoken about the local context. So uh, perhaps you could go around the table again uh, uh, with regard to this question of the trans uh, reproducibility of these uh, methods that you each have talked about. Thank you. Okay, um, so I think with <clears throat> with our maps, uh, with the cosmopolitical maps, the idea is that uh, we have some uh, prompts, and uh, those prompts actually help you start investigating uh, place in spatial terms. And um, these prompts, so <clears throat> some of these prompts are, you know, frame, point of view, um, scale, um, and. Uh, and and that's how basically you need to sort of use different sort of methodologies to then come to the method. So different methods of engaging with the community, you're you know going on transect walks with them, you're taking photographs, but you're also listening to stories. 
Uh, wow. You're also looking at what's going on and um, observing things. So it's really a lot of things that you're observing in the environment whilst talking to people, but also sort of doing your own investigation, which come together on the map. And uh, um, there is no sort of logic to the map in the sense of a spatial log logic, but it's more of a logic which is created through these prompts about uh, how are we seeing, who are we seeing, and uh, what is being seen in the map, and what is being framed, uh, and how are uh, relations kind of um, surfacing on the map, and what is ne uh, what needs to be seen uh, with another entity. So I think uh, in that sense, this is a tool which can really be employed in different sorts of um, uh, situations uh, and geographies and uh, really you'll come up with the uh, different sorts of iterations of the maps because the whole idea of a, of the cosmopolitical map is that it's not a finished map it's not a finished entity you can continue using it and uh, making iterations yeah thanks uh, in my case you know, I try to screen their films a few times and each time when I when I send them the invitation, they would always insist that I find a similar case locally. For example, if I were to screen their firm here in the Netherlands, they would ask me to find another filmmaking group or another neighborhood that is facing action and you know to put the two films side by side so that they can see this experience in just a position. Um, yeah, so so a way of of how this movement is speaking outside of the immediate context of Hong Kong is that you know gentrification and urban renewal is almost everywhere, and so the film can travel to other places because it, these situations are really quite similar, and and so they can they can enlighten each other's practice, also. The group is quite conscious in comparing them or, or like, you know, absorbing from other filmmaker groups um, experience and try to see how they can help each other out. For example, the group has been organizing an annual social movement film festival, uh, I think, uh, since 2010. And so they try to organize with this without any money. They call this a poor people, a poor people's film festival because they have no funding to speak of. And what they do is they try to get the screening rights of the others, other uh, activists from all over the world by trading labor. For example, they would say, how about I do the Chinese subtitle for you and you give us the screening for free. Or they would invite the filmmaker to connect online, to speak to the, you know, to, to speak with the lo uh, local audience in Hong Kong to share experience as a way of providing feedback, etc. Or they would give their screening, the, the, the screening right of their films in order to be screened somewhere else as a, as a process of like trading labor and without involving uh, money. As a way of organizing you know, these different connections and sharing of experience outside the system of capitalism. Yeah, that's all from me on this question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it's quite similar to Isha, but we, one of the, I will also, my experience is only teaching experience, so I will only based on my teaching experience. So it's, uh, what we do, like, we have a story that developed by it based on the local context, but we also expand our networking and partnership in in that kind of contextualized curriculum development or mother tongue based multilingual education curriculum development and indigenous education. So these are like one of the example is a few months ago um, we visited some of the indigenous schools in community-based school in Thailand and then we talk about our one particular stories local context story and then uh, this school the the school the teacher also mentioned that we have a similar one for example forest uh steward uh, goddess and god about the story how do they this forest are steward by the god and goddess that kind of uh similar story we have even though we have 
um, a neighboring country. And then we also, uh, this ethnic group also share a border with Myanmar. So I think these are the really um, significant of the bordering of the, even though they speak different language, but we share oral stories that uh, about the the culture, the the nature, and this society, uh, social practices. So we also saw some of the similar practices, um, social practices in that ethnic community. So this also, I think, expand, expanding uh, networking and partnership in similar platforms, looking for different platforms. This is also right now this. Um, uh, HJB Hub online conversation is also uh, one of the methods that expanding our local context story to the another context. Another, uh, my experience, because I was a, a, one of the illegal migrants um, to to Thailand, and then my story um, was I was I, I I wrote my story in the UNESCO one of the UNESCO book that called Teaching Respect for All. So it's my, about my story, my life experience uh, crossing illegal border, uh, illegally crossing border illegally from Myanmar to Thailand, or uh, walking the whole night from 4 p.m. until 7 a.m. next morning to crossing a border with so many, um, you know, uh, feelings of um, the threat and everything. So. This kind of uh, was used for the teaching respect for all content uh, published by the UNESCO. I think we should write a lot of uh, our experiences to, you know, we should find uh, other different platforms to publish and talk about our stories, local story to expand uh, sharing and learning platforms. Uh, so it's, it's, oh, this is also one of the example of uh, expanding our networking and partnership and sharing platforms. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Asai, maybe uh, if you could maybe uh, write the title of the UNESCO book on the chat. I think many of yeah. us would be very much interested in finding it. Uh, thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. And so the third question would be like, how is the process of co-creation? If you could speak a bit more on this dimension of your practice and your approach to, yeah, to education, but also the mapping and the um, issues, uh, examples also. Uh, okay, I can... I can answer that. Um, so with the maps, we um, have basically, as I um, said in the last kind of uh, response as well, we really sort of work um, with the communities, um, with children, young people, and for Gwadar especially, we were, um, you know, spending a lot of time with the, with the fishermen to uh, get an understanding of how they uh, see the land, but then also how they sort of navigate uh, the sea. And uh, so th and that's when, you know, the whole conversation about winds and uh, winds in different seasons and the stars and the tidal waves kind of came into the conversation. And, and it became increasingly difficult for us to show, um, sort of show all of that in a, in a map that would sort of uh, make sense in a, in a general way. Um, so, so we sort of kind of tried to uh, look at the particularities in the way that they're describing the waves. So, for example, the artist uh, who we were working with, we were really listening to the way um, they're describing the waves or the way they're describing certain uh, plants or trees. And we were trying to uh, see all of these as characters in the story. And when you're talking about characters, you also have to sort of really engage deeply with what the character is like, what is its mood, how does it sort of look like? Um, so will we be using, you know, thin lines, thick lines, what sort of colors would go into the drawing? So we were tr trying to um, get as many uh, as much understanding from the locals um, as possible in terms of how they see a tree, for example, or how they see water. And we were trying to sort of um, draw those iterations as we were kind of listening to them. So it was it was that that method, you know, when you when you have to look for the for the um, 
for the thief or the killer or whoever and you kind of get the person to start making drawings and then the person tells you okay it looks like that or it looks like that and then you you know you come closer to that image of what the what the thief looks like so it it was really that sort of a process in which we were um, trying to work with communities to really understand what these um, objects or these characters are like and then sort of uh, go really deep into how we can uh, visualize those on the map so in that sense, I think it was like a co-creation. Thanks. I think in my case, I already address on how, you know, for a group that is also artists and activists, like the artist part is quite important in terms of how they relent the sense of ownership and say, actually, the community members' concern are more important than our wish to express as an artist. So they really leave the, the film you know, to the community members, like if someone doesn't want like something, they would definitely take it out and not say this is right over the message or the art of the film. And so, so so the other thing is the kind of create not interested to look at it, you know, not part of the <laughs> activism. You know, they would it's not visually interesting, it's not it does not see the outside uh the outside gates it really works for the movement itself so yeah that's it yes uh so i i have shown in my slide that the collaboration with the parents and community elders religious leader cultural leaders and language um leaders i the literary uh comedy leaders they also part of the creating uh, knowledge and in, in indigenous knowledge we just we just do not preserve or protect our knowledge system but we also aim to recreate reproduce our um, indigenous knowledge system in the curriculum so I think um, the here is uh, without participation without meaningful participation from the community from the parents, from the students. And so um, I think that is meaningless or it will be not owner taking owner ownership by the, the community. So this is uh, because the elder also always worry about um, our languages, our culture will be disappears one day because in education, there's no component of preserving, protecting our land and our language, our cultures. So they always wish, to, you know, the elders people, they always want to protect, but they do not know how. So this is our role that we facilitate the platform. We create the platform to reproduce, um, to preserve knowledge and their, their uh, culture and language and this, so on. So that's uh, how we do in, in with the parents and community. So thank you. Um, thank you. And this is the last question. Um, to what extent uh, do you think uh, that your place-based storytelling methodologies, each one of you, um, do they bring the marginalized or those who are silenced or neglected into the, uh, into the picture or to have their voices heard? To what extent do your methods of place-based storytelling allow that? Uh, so one round around the table and then be open to the audience. Yeah, okay, let me start with. Uh, so our our story, story creating story, local story uh, workshop, uh, we do uh, bring, you know, uh, like similar finding, when we approach to students, when we implement this story-based uh, methodology, in teaching learning subject integrated teaching uh, we let them find out who are the uh, you know who has a similar uh, culture or similar stories in our community and also who else that do you think of that kind of like for discussion um, ex ex extending their questions and extending their story and also we uh, we let them, you know, explore different culture. Like uh, in in our country, 
we have our our mano, which is a unity dance, which is a lot of pool that symbolizes uh, unity and the uh, nature that reflect uh, our ancestor knowledge and that kind of thing. Every year we have a gathering, unity dance gathering, but there are very few minority groups that the least population in the country, they also have similar uh, practice, social practices. So we let them explore about the, um, the least population in our country, but they have similar, what are the similarity that they are practicing in, so in their culture and but uh, how, 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 how can, what are the similarity in the culture or languages and social practices? That kind of like uh, analyzing uh, methodology also can can bring marginal voices, voices and also in the community like farmer, uh, they they always feel like they they are not educated. They they are very far from the classroom. But our teaching and uh, like local based story, it's it's uh, we bring our local people like community uh, when we discuss about the farming. Uh, we request our farmers from community villages to come to the classroom and then discuss with the students so so that they are uh, emotionally you know uh, psychologically they are they are a good contributor in in the education development so i think this kind of uh, variety of teaching and learning activities events that also can bring marginalized um, voices in the in in the in in education in education sector, so that's from my experience. Thank you. So um, I will be very brief. For my case, I think there it play out in two ways. In the one is as I speak previously, the disquiet members within the community or the dissenting voices that they dare not to speak in the group setting, but they still, you know, because a lot of this eviction involves real economic interests. They still, eventually they still want this to be heard. And so the filmmaking is a process of bringing in these marginalized voices within the group dynamic to bring them back to the table. And outside of the movement, I, I would say that on the one hand, the group does not believe that, you know, they don't be, they, they don't, they don't quite trust the outside gaze that you would, you know, a distant, uh, audience of the film would really come to come and become part of their, their movement. They don't quite believe in that. So that's why they are able to elance overship and they are able to give this priority to the community members. But that say some of their films still go to film festivals and one, big prizes, especially in Yamagata Film Festival in Japan. And and I think there it speaks to this sheer force of co-creation. The film did not want because of its film style or because of uh, the visual effect, whatever. It, it was really that this is a very profound process of co-creation that the community members understand what the group is doing and there is a cohesion of purpose so that everyone agree on the end product. Yeah. Um, I think I've already laid it out, but I'll say say it again. Uh, apart from the marginalized uh, human communities, which are the the fishermen, the local the local youth, um, the local people who live in Gwadar, it is also um, the the natural landscape. It's also also the water. It is also the uh, plants and trees um, and also you know the fish uh, which is found in the fertile sea which get featured on these maps and they become sort of equally important uh, players in 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 the ordering of that narrative um, and also the the more than human sort of uh, entities such as the mermaid or the or the witch that sits in the tree etc so these sort of entities also kind of um, uh, find a voice through the map um, they become equal um, equal entities um, so I think in that sense uh, that's how the voices come to the fore thank you <laughs>